if I have any slides. Yeah, I'm returning it to you. <laughs> it's always a surprise. What, <laughs> what slide will they give me to talk about? Let's <laughs> see. There we go. How about oh, that? there we go. Okay. Even better. There we go. So, so this is another talk about cancer. And you're thinking, why? Why are we so fascinated by cancer? And, and one reason may be that a diagnosis of cancer may be one of the things that we, as human beings, are most afraid of. You know, our, our own cells betraying us, growing, spreading, and eventually overwhelming us to the point where we can't cope with it anymore, and then we die. But I'm here to tell you about a revolution that is going on at this very moment, a revolution that involves molecular biology, pharmaceutical chemistry, and real out-of-the-box clinical thinking, all actively trying to turn advanced cancer from a death sentence into a life sentence. And I'm going to use lung cancer as an example. Now, why lung cancer? Well, two reasons. First of all, lung cancer is the single biggest cancer killer. Okay, you may have heard of other cancers, but lung cancer kills more men and women than prostate cancer, than breast cancer, than bowel cancer, and pancreas cancer combined. It is the single biggest global cancer problem out there. And if you think it's all to do with smoking, you have another thing coming. The other reason is I'm the director of the lung cancer program, so it's what I'm supposed to know about. <laughs> um, but the principles that I'm going to describe are, I believe, applicable to almost every other cancer that's out there. Now, you might think that uh, a doctor who looks after cancer patients, so I'm a medical oncologist, you'd think that was a depressing job. But it's not. It's actually a lot of joy and laughter in my clinic. We deal with really cool science. So nobody who treats cancer rests on their laurels. Nobody said, hey, we've dealt with cancer. We don't need to worry about it anymore. OK, so clinical research, translational research, basic research is fundamental to cancer medicine. And it's really team science. So I work very closely with my colleagues in the lab who are developing basic understandings about the biology of cancer. I work with my colleagues in molecular pathology to develop diagnostic tests to figure out who to give specific drugs to. I work with my colleagues in the pharmaceutical industry to get access to those drugs. And we really give standard treatment, but certainly in the university setting, we're giving a lot of new treatments to change the future for some of these people with lung cancer. Now, our survival rates are about four times the national average, and that means we get to know our patients very well. Because I have to be honest, there is nothing that strips away the bullshit than having a diagnosis of terminal lung cancer. So you get to know your patients very, very well. Now, when things go badly, you have to get yourself up the next morning, and you have to say, what did I do wrong? What can I do better? How can I change it for the next person? And when you do it well, everybody celebrates together. Now, um, as you may or may not be able to tell from my accent, I'm actually British. Um, uh, I trained entirely in Britain, and then I got headhunted to come here as a kind of finishing school. And I got offers up and down, um, up and down the East Coast. And you think, well, how did you end up in Colorado? Well, they were really good for two things that I was interested in. I was interested in drug development, and I was interested in lung cancer. And we're very well known for both of those. There was also a very interesting attitude. So in some of the more established institutions, and you may find this when you go out there, and you, you know, you're young, you're ambitious, you want to make your mark on the world, and you say, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? And if they say, we don't do it like that here, that is not the place to go and work. So in Colorado, when I said that, the first words out of their mouth were, well, we don't know how to do that here. But the second words were, but we'd like to find out. So that's the kind of place where you can make a mark. So after I'd been here for about two years, they decided they wanted me to run the program. Uh, I decided I want to stay. It was certainly helped by the fact that I met my wife in Colorado. Um, so uh, it's a great place to work. But l let me come back to this revolution that is going on that I want to tell you about. And I want to personalize it. So about five years ago was the first time I gave a patient an experimental tablet in a clinical trial called PF0234-1066. Now, when drugs are first tried out in people, they don't, they don't have you know, a marketing budget. They don't have names. They're just numbers. And this was a woman in her middle 60s. She'd never smoked. Um, and she had advanced lung cancer that was coating the inside of her lungs. And pretty much for the last month or so, every day, multiple times a day, she was coughing up blood. She started on the tablet, and within 24 hours, the blood stopped, and her cough stopped. And when I did the first scan at six weeks, I could not see any evidence of the lung cancer on her scans. And every other patient that I gave this drug to had exactly the same rapid and dramatic response. 
Now, how did I get such a miraculous response? Well, it's not because the drug is a miracle. What was miraculous was knowing what the target of the drug was. The drug interferes with a signaling molecule inside cancer cells that is called ALK, A-L-K. And, and part of the miracle was being able to do a test on a biopsy of that patient's cancer beforehand and showing that an aberrant form of the ALK was driving their cancer. And the marriage of the two, not treating everybody the same, but giving drugs to specific people, was what was miraculous. And when that information came out, that was the fastest licensed drug in oncology. So the drug uh, 1066 now has a name, it's called crizotinib. The first patient was treated in late 2007, it got a license in 2011. And the whole drug development industry in cancer changed overnight. Because it wasn't about finding one drug that was gonna work a little bit in everybody. It was about finding a drug that worked amazingly well in a small number of people. So ALK is only about 4% of lung cancer. So they went from blockbuster drugs to what are called niche buster drugs. Um, and now, we now do multiple molecular tests on everybody's cancer. We look for what are called driver mutations, driver gene rearrangements, the things that are so powerful, if you put them in a normal cell, they'll actually turn them into a cancer cell. And we use that to decide who to give a range of very targeted drugs that shut off particular molecules in the cell. Um, and as this revolution go goes on, um, people became very impassioned about it. And so some of this revolution I'm going to tell you about, so we're all revolutionaries here. I'm a revolutionary, you're revolutionaries too, is we're going to have a mantra. And the first mantra is going to be, one size does not fit all. Okay? There's no one treatment for cancer. Okay, so when we give these people and they have these amazing results, unfortunately nothing good lasts forever. And after about a year, their cancer will start to grow again. Now, traditionally, when you're in a clinical trial, if the cancer starts to grow again, you stop the treatment and you move on to something else. But we were able, as we were watching these patients, to see something very unique going on. Because if they had about 10 deposits of cancer in their body and 10 all shrunk down on this wonderful drug, at about a year, 10 weren't growing. Only one of the deposits might be growing. And we thought maybe what's going on is evolution in real time. What we think is going on is that the cancer, you don't get 100% cell kill, so some of the cancer cells are still alive, and they're slowly turning over, and they have messy biology. They generate mutations all the time, and they generate diversity, and that diversity acts as a palette on which evolution takes place because the environment is now the new drug. And the great thing was, because this was a drug very early in mm -hmm. development, we were able to speak to the sponsors, which was Pfizer, great big megalith of a drug company, but a tiny little team we were working with. And we said, well, fill out all the paperwork you like. This is the time when that first deposit started to grow. But could we do something different? Would you allow us just to treat that one deposit which is growing and keep the drug going? And they said, yes. Now, um, the way we treat that one deposit is we either cut it out or more commonly we bombard that area with focused radiation therapy. Now, my colleagues were merciless in terms of abusing me for doing this. They called it pulling a cabbage. Um, and, uh, you know, it was kind of whispered behind my back. But um, now, as we pretty quickly became, you know, one of the world centers for doing this, we now call it, so in, informally we call it weeding the garden. More formally we call it local ablative therapy and treatment beyond progression. <laughs> but weeding the garden is easy to explain to people. But when, <laughs> but when we do that, and we just published only a couple of months ago, people live twice as long. That whole idea of understanding the biology, that the cancer is a living thing, it doesn't have a brain, but it's just trying to evolve. And you can slow that down until the next evolutionary clone pops up. It was amazing. So the second mantra of the revolution is don't walk away from a good thing. Okay, now when these areas start to grow, the question started to rise. What is changing in the biology of these cancers? So let's say you had one deposit in the liver that was starting to grow. We biopsied it and we reanalyzed it. Now, the easiest way the cancer can adapt is it changes the target for the drug. Okay, your drug is going in, in there, it's interacting with an enzyme, so the, the cancer will just make more of the enzyme. Or it'll mutate the enzyme so the drug doesn't bind as tightly. Now, we now have second-generation inhibitor drugs which bind even more, more tightly and are good at getting the cancer back under control. But what about those ones where the, the target is still there, it's the same. What else might be coming up? 
So suddenly if this is a driver abnormality, now the cancer is putting another steering wheel in the car and there's something else driving it because you've blocked one. We have a very active research program to find out what is driving these mechanisms of resistance because then we can find new drugs to combine up front to prevent them from occurring. The other thing that came about, again from just really good team observation, was that 50% of people, when they started to grow on these drugs, the cancer was actually growing in their brain, even if they didn't have cancer in their brain to begin with. And what we now think is going on, this isn't a change in the biology of the cancer, this is actually a failure of delivery of the drug to the brain. So as you may or may not know, your brain sits on the other side of something called the blood-brain barrier that we developed so that you could put all kinds of you know, nasty stuff in your body and it wouldn't mess up your brain too much, alcohol being an obvious exception. Um, and that also applies to many drugs, that they, they either don't get in or they get in and they're pumped out again. So there is a whole new industry coming about from two things. One is we have to design clinical trials to actually look at measuring benefit within the brain. Because we didn't, you know, we wouldn't routinely scan the brain on clinical trials. Or if we did, we would lump it together in the body. Now there's a big national push to actually have different endpoints. So in the future, you might have a drug and you say the response in the body, oops, did the same thing. Um, <laughs> the response in the body is X, but the response in the brain may be Y. The duration of benefit in the body is X, the duration of benefit in the brain may be Y. And we really need to capture that data if we're going to really address the idea that the brain is a battleground. It's also going to bring into uh, to the pharmaceutical chemists because we have drugs that work wonderfully well in the body, but the brain is essentially an untreated part of your body. All you have to do is tweak the molecular structure to get it across that barrier. You don't need to find a new target. You just need to treat the target that's existing in a different part of your body so that you don't just treat everything that's below the neck. So the third mantra is, if the cancer moves, follow it. Follow it and understand it. And the fourth mantra is really very simple. The fourth mantra is question everything. You remember I said that if you've got somebody on a drug and nine sites of disease are still being suppressed and one is starting to grow, if you take them off the drug, the other nine sites of disease will start to flare up again. For me, the ultimate question is why, even though you have these wonderful responses on scans, why are those nine deposits not killed? Why don't we achieve 100% cell kill? Because unless we can look at that, that siege state, that reservoir of resistance that's existing in those patients, we will never cure cancer. So the, it may be stem cells. So stem cells are actually bad in cancer or a stem-like state. But finding the biology of that resistant yet still drug-sensitive state is the next horizon that we've got to aim for. So what I want to leave you with is the idea that to achieve this is going to take a large amount of work, some real out-of-the-box thinking, and a ton of resource. So actively pursue a career in biomedical sciences. Chase down your creative ideas. Find million-dollar donors and get them to give to your favorite cancer charity. <laughs> and then all together, let's go change the world. Thank you.